Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> And welcome to the January 18th regular meeting, 2016 regular meeting of council. I'd like to um, apologize tonight on behalf of uh, Councillors Powell and Councillor Salter. They were unable to make the meeting. The city of Parksville recognizes the people of the Coast Salish Nations and their traditional territory upon which we gather with gratitude. The first item we have tonight is the minutes of the council meeting held December the 14th, 2015. Do I have a mover and a seconder for these minutes? Moved by Councillor Beale, seconded by Councillor Patterson. Are there any errors or omissions? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you, that is carried. The next item is the minutes of the special council meeting held January 7th, 2016. Are there any errors or omissions in these minutes? I have a mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Greer, seconded by Councillor Oates. All those in favor? Thank you, that is approved. Looking at tonight's agenda, <clears throat> I, need a, I need an approval of tonight's agenda. I have a mover and a seconder. Moved by Councillor Beale, seconded by Councillor Greer. All those in favor? Thank you, that is carried. We have one delegation this evening, and it's from the Vancouver Island Students Union and Canadian Federation of Students of BC. And uh, I believe I have Mr. Patrick Barbosa and Janelle Davies. Um, I, you're not Patrick Barbosa. You are? Did I pronounce that properly? You know, Barbosa is a famous name. You know, Frederick Barbosa was a famous character. Anyway, <laughs> I digress. You've got 10 minutes. Welcome. Welcome to the city, and please uh, feel free to tell us what you're, why you're here. Hi there. Um, so my name is Simka Marshall, and I'm the chairperson of the Canadian Federation of Students BC. Um, I'll be taking Janelle's place uh, tonight in our presentation, and I am a second year poli sci student. And my name is Patrick Barbosa. I'm staff at Vancouver Island University Students Union, and I'm currently uh, enrolled in a post degree diploma in business at Vancouver Island University. Okay, um, so tonight we're talking about adult basic education, um, and so I will just jump right in and talk about uh, uh, who adult basic education students are. So we can basically break down um, ABE students into three categories. So uh, the first one is for students who are seeking to complete their high school studies. The second one is for those seeking to upgrade their high school courses. Um, and the third is for those seeking to improve uh, basic literacy or numeracy skills. Um, so we often see uh, students going through ABE programs who are looking to upgrade um, maybe their science or their math marks um, or their English marks in order to, to access um, a university or college program. So we see that a lot with nursing and other STEM sciences. Um, there is also um, ABE students uh, who uh, are in adult special ed programs um, as well as English as a second language students. Um, so adult basic education students often come from British Columbia's most marginalized groups. Uh, we can note that 58% of students attending ABE in British Columbia are women. 18% of people attending ABE in British Columbia are Indigenous students. 20% uh, are parents while they're studying. And 55% of students in adult basic education are employed while they're studying. Uh, we see a lot of students have graduated. And of the ABE, st ABE students that uh, uh, 70% of those students continue on and pursue an additional credentials, so a diploma or degree or certification. And so really on, uh, ABE makes up sort of a gateway to uh, increased economic opportunities for students in British Columbia. And so these are often people who are trying to find you know, better income to, to support themselves and their family. So just to provide a little bit of history, um, on ABE in British Columbia. So back in 1998, all ABE, including fundamental programming and ABE in post-secondary um, institutions uh, was tuition free. Um, in 2002, uh, ABE learners with who held high school diplomas uh, started getting charged tuition fees um, in the ABE programs that are offered through post-secondary institutions. Um, and then in 2007, the provincial government abolished tuition fees on all all adult upgrading courses in both um, the K-12 system as well as the post-secondary system. So at the time, 
uh, Minister of Advanced Education, Murray Cole, made the following statement. We are helping people upgrade their education so they can take advantage of our growing economy and enjoy rewarding careers. By offering free tuition for adult basic education, whether students have graduated or not. So that's really a glowing endorsement from the, from the government of the day. The government hasn't changed. Um, and basically making the case for why adult basic education should be free in British Columbia. So um, in December 2014, there were some major changes made to adult basic education programming in BC. Um, so that day on December 4th, the provincial government announced a $6.9 million funding cut to ABE. At the same time, they also announced that institutions would be able to place tuition fees um, on the cost-free ABE courses. Um, and this was done with less than a month's notice. Um, so starting January 1st, institutions um, had the ability to charge up to $1,600 per semester, um, which breaks down into $320 per course on all adult upgrading um, courses. And then starting May 1st, the government would no longer fund um, school districts for tuition-free upgrading courses um, for those who already hold a high school diploma. Um, at the same time as, as these announced, as at the same time as these funding cuts, they also announced a 33 incre increase um, in funding to the adult upgrading grants program. Um, despite increasing funds to that program, um, the, the government actually uh, changed the requirements for those um, accessing the, the grants. So the grants are meant to cover things like textbooks and supplies and tuition and childcare um, and transportation, um, but they changed the thresholds in a way that uh, they became so low that there are many applicants who actually were, um, will be unable to qualify for those, fund for those funds. Um, so for example, if you are a family family of one, you must make um, less than $23,000 a year, which when you break that down um, hourly, you would have to make less than $11.40 in order to qualify for the grant. So if you were to make $11.50 um, or $12 an hour, you would make too much money to, quali um, to qualify uh, for this grant. Um, they also uh, changed, uh, they make it so that if you are 10% above the threshold, you can have only up to 50% of just your tuition fees covered. And, and just to provide a VIU context, I mean, we, we talk to folks on campus all the time, um, and we know for a fact that there are many uh, people in our communities that are just slightly above the threshold. And if you're making $11.40 an hour, the proposition of paying $300 or $320 for a course, you're losing some time at work, you have to pay for textbooks, all sorts of additional expenses, is not an easy one to handle. I make substantially more than that, and even, uh, even taking two courses a semester is quite a financial burden uh, for me and my family. Uh, importantly, though, uh, there has never been a justification for this decision provided by the BC government. They've never said, well, hey, it makes sense to, to reduce access to adult basic education. They've never provided sort of any of the rationale behind that decision. Um, and so, you know, we're left here hanging, and, and this is why we're doing this work around the province. So fast forward. Um, here's the pres here's the presentation from Minister Peter Minister of Education Peter Fassbender, who was the lead for uh, for the BC government on this decision, uh, basically saying high school is not free, but further or high school is free, but further upgrading is not. I think it is reasonable to expect adults who've already graduated to contribute to these costs. A couple of factors. Um, the first is when we made a decision in around 1900 to provide free K-12 education to citizens of British Columbia, a, a high school diploma was a substantially higher level of education than it is today. Uh, the other factor um, is that it really, you know, at the end of the day, this doesn't just affect those who have graduated, it affects those who haven't graduated. And for folks who are just trying to find a meaningful place for themselves in the BC economy, it really is, in my mind, unreasonable when we're performing quite well economically to begin charging them courses or charging them to access K-12 education. So this, um, this is what BC students' response was to uh, the cuts made to adult basic education. Um, so we developed a campaign. It's called uh, Don't Close the Doors. Um, and what it is is a, it's a petition-based campaign. So we have um, both an online petition as well as uh, postcards that we get um, folks to sign that uh, go to the provincial government asking them to um, restore funding to adult basic education programs as well as a 
eliminate tuition fees on those programs. Um, so with throughout this campaign, we have collected um, a number of endorsements. Um, so we've been getting a lot of organizations signing on as coalition, coalition partners um, because they recognize the importance of adult basic education uh, for this province. So this is just one example of someone who's benefited, for, benefited from adult basic education. Uh, Richard, uh, I understand, uh, s suffered through the cycle of addiction and actually was able to find um, access to adult basic education. He's currently in his final year uh, of a Bachelor of Social Work and is planning to work in the community to help uh, people who need support. And so I, I know myself, I actually was able to take advantage of ABE in around 2001 when it was a free program. Um, and I have to say, had that program uh, had tuition fees attached to it, it is very unlikely that I would have moved on, studied at a university, uh, you know, got a meaningful career that could provide for my family, and as a single parent, uh, that meant a lot to, to myself and to my daughter. Um, so here, this is an example of some of the organizations that have signed on as coalition partners to date. Um, so we, ha we have received support from the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, um, from the BC Teachers Federation, from the University of Victoria Student Society. Um, and with, with the launch of this campaign, uh, we, we picked up a, a lot of momentum with um, hearing from coalition partners and students, but not even just students. We've heard back from uh, members of the community who, all around the province who have talked about how EBE has really changed your lives or how the, the changes um, to the ABE programming is going to affect their ability to actually participate in school or get into post-secondary institutions in the future. Um, to add to the list of endorsements, we've also received um, unanimous endorsements from the four previous city councils that we've approached. So the city of Victoria has endorsed the campaign, the city of New Westminster, the city of Duncan, and the city of Burnaby. Uh, we did a presentation to the city of Qualicum last week, and they have a policy to hold off to the next meeting to make a decision, but it was well received there. In addition, I can say that we've been working with the Chamber of Commerce in Nanaimo and the Chamber of Commerce in Duncan, and both organizations uh, have indicated that they're very likely to support the campaign. So why we're here today. Yeah, so what we are looking for um, from, from, from you folks is um, to, to help us with this campaign and to keep ABE accessible in BC by endorsing the campaign. Um, and we've also asked, uh, so the City of Victoria, for example, um, not only endorsed the campaign, but um, has also sent a, a letter to the Ministry of Education as well as Ministry of Advanced Education asking them to reinstate the funding um, and to, to take away the tuition fees to keep it accessible for students. And just, and just an additional note, I mean, city councils obviously represent people directly in the community, and so uh, we, we found that folks in your position understand the importance of providing opportunity to people so that they can pull themselves up and find a meaningful role in the economy. And so for us, having the support of city councils means a lot, and it actually strengthens the campaign quite a bit. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Very, uh, very uh, directed towards the issues. Members of Council, any questions for the delegation? Councillor Oates. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it's a shame that you have to come here and make it, uh, but uh, unfortunately you do. When did, uh, the, uh, when did uh, you guys partner up and start this campaign? Um, so we launched the campaign uh, a few months after the funding announcements uh, first came to be. So it was launched in April of earlier this year. Oh, I guess 2015 now. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you can answer this or not, but have, do, do you have any evidence of, an, of a decrease in enrollment because of this uh, elimination of the funding? So the results vary from institution to institution. So for example, at Vancouver Community College, they've seen a decrease in enrollment uh, close to 80%. Um, in, in the VIU Duncan campus, we've seen a decrease in enrollment, but as it turns out, at the Nanaimo campus, we've seen a slight increase in enrollment. We don't know the reason yet, but it's very likely that that's as, li as closely linked to the uh, current state of the oil sands as anything else. We do know, though, for, for a fact that many students, despite increased enrollment, many students are not able to access the programs because they're you know, marginally above the threshold for the adult upgrading grant, and so they're being closed out of the, out of the system. Any other members of council? Councillor Greer and Councillor Beal. Thank you, Worship. Um, I think it's a great cause, and I certainly support that. 
Um, I qualify for most of those things that you presented. Is there, is there an age limit? Uh, <laughs> uh, there, there is no age limit that I'm aware of, um, but if, uh, you know, and maybe in 10 years or so when you reach retirement, you could uh, apply for uh, free tuition-free courses at VIU. Right. We do provide tuition-free courses to people yeah. above 65. I've so. never really found out what I wanted to do when I grew up, you know, so thanks. I know the feeling. You still do. <laughs> Councillor Beale. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you very much for the presentation this evening. And uh, uh, certainly, very you know, such there are such important programs, and I know of a number of people, uh, both here in this community and elsewhere in the province, who have benefited from the uh, adult basic education programs, and and in all cases have gone on to uh, to do very worthwhile and productive things with their lives. And and some were post secondary. Well, they're all involved some post secondary afterwards but often um, you know kind of what I would call regular jobs but that needed that needed some qualifications and credentials and as single parents um, barely making it they just wouldn't have had that door open to them and once they got into it and and believed and saw what they could do they um, they did really well so thank you for bringing this to our council Councillor Patterson thank you your worship could you just go back to your last slide so you're asking us how we can, can help. So endorsing the campaign, either a letter of support from the city of, of Parksville or, as you said, sharing on social media or press release or letter writing. So the letter writing would be a letter to the provincial government or that's what I'm asking. Yeah, so um, having uh, an endorsement from the council, uh, like through a, a, sorry, a motion to endorse the campaign from the council, um, as well as um, a letter that would be directed to, to both the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Advanced Education, um, asking them to, to reinstate the funding um, and to reverse the policy um, that implemented the, the tuition fees. Um, Follow up? Not so much a follow-up, but can we revisit this? Uh, I have I have a couple of questions first, and then I'll. You want to talk to also? Okay, I have two questions. When you say on May 1st, 2015, the government will no longer fund school districts for tuition-free upgrading courses for adults who already hold a high school diploma, I guess they have to go back to high school to upgrade the high school diploma. Is that is that the reason? Yeah. So there's there's a couple of so there's a couple of ways people can access or historically there's been a couple of ways people can access adult basic education. Uh, one of those ways was through universities or colleges, um, in classes, uh, studying with a professor. The other model was uh, something that's offered through an uh, organization called North Island Distance Education. There are several of them throughout the province, and basically you could do distance training uh, for your upgrading. Now those programs used to be funded, but as it turns out, after they announced the cut, after the BC government announced the cut for six point. I would argue a paltry $6.9 million uh, for institutions. They then made a, a latter decision to also cut funding for um, the other organizations that provided access to ABE as well. When, uh, before the, the, this program was canceled, what was the overall cost to the government? Do you, do you have any idea how much money that was? $6.9 million across the province. There was, there, actually, sorry, there's two envelopes. There was one for the post-secondary system, which was $6.9 million, and there was one that was offered through the K-12 system, which was around $14 million. So 20, 21.9 is my estimate. Thank you. Councillor Oates. Mayor Your Worship, I'd like to make a motion. I move that the City of Parksville endorse the Don't Close the Doors campaign and that the City of Parksville write the pro provincial government indicating that we support the ca campaign and requesting that they reinstate the funding that was cut. I think, uh, I think uh, you know, we as uh, uh, at the municipal level, we're continually being reminded about the downloading of the services on a, uh, uh, from the different levels of government. This is one that has a direct economic impact, I believe, down the road. The, uh, one of the statistics that uh, was in the presentation that really resonates with me is the fact that 70% of the people who access ABE then go on to continue their studies. So it truly is as a step in the right direction. 
if uh, if if we in some small way can help this uh, organization by lending our name to it I think the unanimous support of this council is, uh, is the right thing for us to do tonight and I ask for council to provide unanimous support support for the motion just a, a little more specific in terms of the letter would go to the premier with a copy of the Minister of Education is that the way you see it going mrs. Coleman your Worship, I would see it going to the Minister of Education and Minister of Advanced Education with a copy to the Premier. Thank you. Okay, any further comments? Uh, very well said, by the way, Councillor Oates. Seeing no further comments, I'll call the vote. All those in favour? Opposed? Thank you. That is carried unanimously, and thanks again for your presentation. Good luck. <coughs> Okay, we have a number of reports tonight, uh, members of council. And the first one is the uh, 2016 uh, sanitary sewer utility and parcel tax rates. Mr. Butterworth, would you please give us the background on the issues? <clears throat> uh, yes, Your Worship. The 2015 to 19 approved financial plan and the 2016 to 20 draft provisional financial plan that's in tonight's agenda. Both include sanitary sewer rate increases of 5%. The higher increases are necessary to maintain the accumulated surplus, accumulated sewer reserves at a recommended amount of $1 million. At this point, reserves are forecast to fall below 1 million at the end of 2018 and remain there through 2020. The increase amounts to about $6 per year for the average residential property and the recommendation is as per the agenda. Thank you, and I'd like to remind Council that we discussed this during the budget meetings uh, for a number of times last year. So, are there any questions for Mr. Butterworth on the four recommendations? Seeing none, I'm going to ask for a mover and a seconder for the four recommendations. Moved by Councillor Greer, seconded by Councillor Abiel. All those in favour? Opposed? Thank you. That is carried. Mr. Butterworth, once again, the 2016 water utility and parcel tax rates. Would you please give us the background on this issue? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Um, major projects upcoming in the water utility fund require significant funds to complete. Uh, current reserves in the water fund are quite healthy, but it is prudent to maintain inflationary water rate increases until the new water infrastructure is complete to ensure sufficient funds are available. The 2016 to 2020 draft provisional financial plan includes water rate increases of 2.5% for 2016. Uh, this increase would amount to between $9 to $10 per year for the average residential property and recommendations as per the agenda. Thank you. And once again, we discussed it during the budget, uh, budget discussions in the last several weeks. I have a mover and a seconder for the recommendation moved by Councillor Oates, seconded by Councillor Beal. <clears throat> Any comments, questions? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. That is carried unanimously. <clears throat> Moving on with our reports, we now have the consideration of proceeding with a notice for a development vari variance permit on amended lot 13, DD 89664N, District Lot 3, Nanus District Plan 6031, 673 Pioneer Crescent to vary the maximum residential fence height requirements. Mr. Russell, would you please give us the background on this issue? If I may, Your Worship, um, this is a case of an existing fence um, that was constructed in order to screen, better screen the subject property from surrounding commercial uses. Um, it is a, a decorative wood fence um, that happens to be over height. They're uh, requesting a relaxation um, for a fence not exceeding 2.2 meters um, versus the regular standard of 1.2 meters within the front yard and 2 meters within all other yards. We have uh, two recommendations, and uh, there were pictures accompanying this, so pictures stay a thousand words. <coughs> Excuse me, do I have a mover and a seconder for the recommendation? Moved by Councillor Beale, seconded by Councillor Greer. Any comments, observations? Okay, pretty straightforward. Seeing none, I'm going to call the vote. All those in favour? Opposed? Thank you, that is carried unanimously. <coughs> The next item we have is a consideration of a development permit for the Joe Cunningham Ford dealership on Lot 1, District Lot 4, Manus District, Plan EPP 54949, 410 Island Highway East. Mr. Russell. 
Would you please give us the background on this issue? Sure, if I may, Your Worship. Um, this is an application for a development permit to uh, refresh the outside appearance um, at the Joe Cunningham Ford dealership, as well as to um, do some landscaping um, improvements along the perimeter of the property. I'm just going to bring up a, a sketch that sort of illustrates the current appearance of the building, uh, the architectural drawings, and then what I believe are similar um, Ford dealerships. It's part of, I believe it's part of a, a Ford Canada re-imaging of their dealership network. So this is the current, at the top here we have the current Joe Cunningham Ford dealer's appearance. This is the architectural drawing, and then here would be some uh, other Ford Canada dealerships that I believe are in keeping with this uh, proposed architectural drawing. And then if council wants to, um, these are the landscaping plans in color. I wasn't sure if they were distributed to you, but they're, they're here as well. Any questions? Oh, I need a mover and a second or first. Ladies and gentlemen, moved by Councillor Greer, seconded by Councillor Patterson. Any questions for Mr. Russell on this issue? I might add that uh, there's been a considerable amount of meetings between staff and, and the staff of uh, Joe Cunningham Ford to get this uh, to get this right because I, I believe the roof was leaking, Mr. Russell, and a few other I items. So, pretty important that this get done. Okay, seeing no questions, I'm going to call the vote on recommendations one and two. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. That is carried. Once again, Mr. Russell, consideration of a development permit to facilitate exterior upgrades to the Bellinas building at Tynamara Resort, 1155 Resort Drive. Would you please give us the background on these issues? Certainly, if I may, Your Worship. This is part of the ongoing um, building maintenance at Tynamara Resort. This is the second building um, now to be before council for renovation. Um, the renovations are strictly um, based on changing changes to the exterior of the building as part of an ongoing maintenance program. Um, they include um, replacing, putting some basically hardy plank siding on, on the building as well as replacing um, the existing decks with, with um, glazed decks in keeping with the, the fire smart guidelines. Do I have a mover and a seconder for the, for the two recommendations? Moved by Councillor Greer, seconded by Councillor Beal. Uh, this is similar, Mr. Russell, to what was approved earlier on by, I believe, this past summer. Uh, a similar situation in a similar building, yes. Co questions from Council? I just wanted to just reiterate the, your point there. I believe the other building was the Gabriola building or something. This is just a continuation yeah. of that retrofit. Yes, it is. Okay, seeing no further comments or questions, I'm going to call the vote. All those in favor of the two recommendations? Thank you, that is carried unanimously. Okay. We let Mr. Russell go. And the next item is... Um, uh, we had a, a citizen by the name of Mr. Jack Verspagen who made a presentation at, I believe, the last council meeting regarding sidewalks on Surreal Road. Mr. Figuera, would you please give us the background on this issue regarding Mr. Figuera's uh, concern regarding sidewalks? Oh, I'm sorry, and I'm going to ask for a mover and a seconder that the report from the Director of Engineering dated January the 11th entitled Jack Verspagen Sidewalks on Surreal Road be received. Councillor Greer's, uh, no, I'm sorry, Councillor Beal, seconded by Councillor Oates. Okay, Mr. Mr. Figuera, please. If I may, if I may, Your Worship. Um, so before Council is a staff report in response to Resolution 15-320 from the last scheduled meeting on December the 7th. Uh, on that date, uh, Mr. Verspagen appeared in a, as, a, uh, as a delegation, presented uh, Council with a petition and uh, just to kind of get the right words here in terms of the petition. The petition was, uh, we request the city uh, bylaws for subdivision be followed and carried out to include sidewalks on all road fronts of the development. Uh, they're referring to the 511 Soriel development. Uh, this request is primarily for pedestrian safety and also to maintain our standards for pedestrian highways as has been carried out on the recent previous developments in this area. So after that, uh, Council passed a resolution for staff to create a report on the requirements under the bylaw and, and how they're being met by this development. So the report in front of you under the analysis section talks about the particular bylaws involved and how the uh, uh, 
requirements of the development have been determined by staff. And the, um, the report is submitted for, uh, for councils. Uh, so, so basically, uh, Mr. Verspagen misinterpreted the bylaws? If I may, Your Worship, um, the particular bylaw in question is, um, so under the Local Government Act, um, that stipulates subdivision and development requirements, and under there, um, Section uh, 938 is uh, what we use um, for subdivision and the requirements of works and services. And uh, in there, I just sort of underlined under Section 938, the, uh, one of the operative phrases is in accordance with the standards established in bylaw under this section on that portion of a highway immediately adjacent to the site being subdivided or developed up to the center line of the highway. Uh, as our subdivision bylaw then is, is what we go by. And in our subdivision vision bylaw, we have our engineering standards and specifications that form part of that. And under our standards and specifications, I included uh, um, standard drawing RC1, which describes what we require in terms of infrastructure on local roads. And uh, what we require is to have sidewalk on one side. The previously 120 meters of sidewalk that was installed was installed on the south side. According to our bylaw, we would then, uh, um, at the time of a previous subdivision on the south side of Soriel, uh, the side that the sidewalk was to be on was chosen at that point and defined at that point. So then we wouldn't start uh, mirroring that with sidewalk on the other side because uh, at the end of the day, we would end up with sidewalk on both sides, which is not according to our specifications. And therefore, if we require that of, of a developer, uh, we could not require that of a, of a developer. They would come back and just, you know, we're, we have to stick to our uh, specifications. Pretty straightforward. Any questions for Mr. Uh, Mr. Figueroa on this item? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to call the vote. All those in favor uh, that the report be received? Foes, thank you, that's unanimous, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Figueroa, once again, uh, purchase of speed reader boards. Um, would you please give us the background on why we're leading up to buying speed reader boards? So before council is a report to, to seek authorization for staff to, uh, to use funds from our accumulated surplus to purchase a couple of uh, solar powered speed reader boards. Uh, recently, uh, ICBC, let us know that they had, uh, uh, in terms of the money they have available, uh, had available in 2015, not all of it was used for grants. So they gave us a call and said, hey, we got some money that hasn't been accounted for. Uh, we, would, we would put it towards uh, uh, this type of uh, speed reader board uh, signage. And um, so in order for us to take advantage of that, it, it amounts to about 2,500 bucks, which if you look at the total cost of the speed reader boards is, is uh, uh, I think it ends up being about, well, the total cost of the speed reader boards is about uh, just under 20, 20 grand. So yeah, so uh, that would be two and a half thousand off of that. Um, in, in, In carrying out our, our, our duties that we uh, that we have to in, in terms of engineering and, and trying to um, educate the public on uh, certain corridors where they they, they should really be uh, um, reducing their speed, this would this would help us out quite a bit. We do have a speed reader board that has a programmable LED sign on it. Um, we have found that in recent past that that board is often in use at another part of the city and, and we would we could really use some more hardware to uh, to put on places like Despard for extended periods of time to try to slow traffic down. That's one of the ideas is that we would install uh, at least one of these signs for an extended period of time on Despard and, and what it does is um, if the uh, speed limit is being uh, exceeded, it's similar to the one that's on the highway as you go towards uh, Nanaimo from here. There's a, it looks like a regular uh, speed sign, except it's got digital numbers on it. And if you're speeding, it flashes and, and, and tells you what your speed is and what, what you should be going at. Um, so it's programmable in that way. You can program it to be activated during school hours or there's, uh, there's a number of different uh, um, features that you, you can program into it. 
we think it would be quite useful for us to use that type of technology to uh, to help us out with that, and, and it would also help us um, with our um, local improvement um, program, not a local improvement program, but um, um, I'm trying to think of the name of it, it's just eluding me, but it's our uh, our program to reduce speeds in, in, uh, in uh, on local roads, um, so it would help us out there too. Thank you. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Did I get a mover and a seconder for this? I don't remember. I did? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, comments or questions for Mr. Figuera? Um, Councillor Beal and then Councillor Greer. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, to Mr. Figuera. Uh, in the report, it mentions that um, uh, the city is reluctant to construct sidewalks, referring to Despard Avenue particularly, um, reluctant to construct sidewalks at this time as a development is in the works which will be required to build these at their cost. Is, is there any word on when this development might be coming forward to the city? Because uh, I haven't heard about this before. If I may, Your Worship, through to Councillor Beale. Um, in the not too distant past, there was there was some uh, interest in in uh, development on the north side of Despar, just uh, east of Alberni Highway. Uh, I am not sure currently what the act uh, what the activity is uh, on that particular development. I'm not sure if there's any if the city has received any uh, any inquiries or anything related to that. It's it's difficult it's difficult to say. Councillor Greer. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm just interested in how effective these signs really are. Um, I know the one in the noose, um, everybody slows down because there's a stop sign there also. And um, But I know, and I travel the road quite a bit, um, people still fly through there at a pretty good pace. So I don't know if you have any statistics and how effective that is and whether you think it's worth the, the $20,000. Um, I don't have the specific statistics on me. We, we do have information that, you know, the Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure um, uh, and the Transportation Association of Canada both endorse the use of these type of uh, speed reader boards. Um, and the latter is currently developing standardized guidelines for their use uh, in Canada. So there is, uh, there are statistics out there that, that they're following that, that are, uh, moving them to endorse these types of speed reader boards um, but a, a exact data I don't have that I don't have that on I noticed when you're driving towards Nanaimo coming to the base of the um, of the hill at the Petro Canada station I see a lot of cars slow down to keep make they're coming down the hill at a quite a speed and they slow down because the speed limit is 60, 60 kilometers an hour I believe there so I see it. I see a lot of brakes being put on. So, uh, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Worship. You just actually kind of mentioned that. Is that the approximate size of of a reader board, like the the sign towards the Ninus Petro Canada, where it goes down to? If I may, your work, uh, uh, your Worship. Um, yes, that uh, that is uh, that is the typical size of the sign. That it would be very much like that sign that you see on the highway there. Uh, just to follow up, and this is movable, or is it? Would it be stationary? Like it's it's either you can placement. you can leave it because it's solar panel and it's got batteries. You can put it anywhere. So what we would do is uh, typically we would attach it to a street light pole um, on the particular street they're interested in. Um, you could leave it there for extended periods of time, or you could move it around. Uh, the, the nice thing about these two is you're able to collect. It's got uh, radar data that you can collect. And uh, the type of radar data actually is is uh, is superior to the to the uh, equipment that we have uh, right now with the speed reader board. Thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Oates? This uh, funding, this twenty-five hundred dollars, is it just is is this the only application that it could be used for? Uh, if I may, Your Worship. Uh, through to Councillor Oates. Um, it's my understanding that uh, that uh, it could be used for for other things. This is one item that was mentioned that uh, that was supportable from uh, from IC, from ICBC. 
Uh, but it, it could use, be used for other items. Uh, just a comment. I, I'm, you know, uh, it's, it's like we're trying to spend 20000 because we got the offer of saving 2500 or something. And uh, absent this being a concern that came before us in council before, I don't recall coming to speeding being an issue there. Perhaps it is. I'm not saying it isn't. I'm certainly not saying that I'm against uh, safety. I mean, I'm the person that supported 30 kilometers around all the playgrounds. But to spend $16,000 because we got 2,500 coming from ICBC is just, just not computing for me. I, I got the impression from reading the report that staff staff support this for for safety reasons overall. If I may, Your Worship, uh, um, these sorts of technologies are uh, are being worked on all the time. Um, yeah, I, I understand um, uh, what Councillor Oates is is referring to. Um, um, we don't always know. Um, uh, we try to keep up on the technology that's out there. Technology is being developed all the time. Uh, we became aware of this uh, a short time ago. Uh, we've been looking at it. Um, ICBC has come forward and said uh, they'll support us uh, uh, to the tune of $2,500 to look at this or to get this technology. Um, we just found that uh, um, it would be worth asking for. It, it would help us. It would definitely help us um, whether we get two or one um, at this point. Um, perhaps the, uh, you know, a uh, 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 possibility if, if council would, would like to consider uh, getting one of these, trying them out, seeing how useful uh, uh, they end up being, seeing if they, they have an effect, the effect that we want. Um, um, that would also be a, a positive thing uh, out of this report. Sir Beal, and then I have Councillor Patterson, and then back to Councillor Rhodes. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, uh, you know, certainly I would want to support uh, improving some safety, uh, particularly along Desbarred Avenue. I think that anyone in the neighborhood. Uh, that uses that road recognizes how how dangerous it is and it is a road that's used heavily with uh, traffic coming down the Alberni Highway and or going to and from the Alberni Highway from the east end of town and uh, the central area uh, so you know and I I do think that these devices are certainly an improvement over some of the older ones because of the fact that it does not always show your speed so it, it, it flashes when you're going over the speed limit and uh, so on. I don't think it would solve all the problems of safety along that road at all but I can see uh, that we would have a real need for it and in other areas. I am curious, it is something that's specific only to speed. Is it possible to program it to um, give another message just as in the past uh, summer we used uh, a board to indicate that it was conservation level four for water is it possible to program a message on these boards if I may your worship through Councillor Beale uh, this is quite specific it's really dealing with the speeds there's various conditions and times of day that can be programmed to, to send uh, the appropriate message, but the message is always uh, about speed. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Worship. I echo uh, Councillor Beale's um, thoughts and everything as it's a very, very busy street, and one that I use and I'm in that um, area of the city. Um, so I would recommend and and support one of the reader boards or the sign speed feedback signs or whatever. Um, so I'd like council maybe to consider not having two of these at this point in time, but think about having one of them um, and see and go from there. So those are my Councilor Rhodes. <clears throat> okay, uh, uh, thank you, Your Worship. So I have a very high opinion of the opinion of staff. So 
So I'm going to ask you this question. If we were to give you $16,200 tonight, with no strings attached, other than spend it in the best interest of the city, is this how you'd spend it? If I may, Your Worship, through to Councillor Oates. Um, I would. Uh, we have received a number of uh, um, call-ins from from the uh, from the public um, on speeding you know, speeding issues on Despard, and it's mainly to do with the safety of the school kids that are trying to get to the Springwood School. Um, a number of kids use that corridor. We've we've tried to. Uh, Kind of hold uh, or circle the airport and uh, and uh, create a uh, a wider space on the north side of Despard where where they could walk. Invariably, though, uh, and I've seen it myself, uh, you'll have uh, kids on skateboards, on scooters, on the pavement. And and I understand, I understand it. Um, um, the widened shoulder we have on the north side is uh, chip seal and it's it's not smooth. And, and that's why, I'm sure that's why uh, the kids on uh, with the skateboards and stuff and the scooters are, are not not uh, using it all the time. Um, so this was thought to be a, a, um, a tactic to uh, educate the public. Uh, certainly during school hours, this sign would activate and come on and uh, remind people that they really should be slowing down. Uh, certainly in school hour in school hours uh, we're looking for opportunities and ways from 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 staff's perspective to try to uh, hang in there for uh, development to occur there uh, uh, we don't have the desk part itself is is in the books in the capital plan for 2025 and uh, using the various ways we we weigh these capital projects that where we, that's where we put it in 2025 uh, as an interim measure, if we could find ways, and this is one way we thought we could we could uh, try to address some safety concerns there until uh, either until development occurs or until 2025 comes around. Quick follow-up. The request is for two. Were, were, was the intent to use both up there on this bird, or can your purpose be achieved with one? It's been suggested that maybe we could consider one. It is one. Does one suit your purpose, or do you need two to achieve the uh, safety uh, level of safety education that you require? From here, worship through to Councillor Oates. In terms of Despard itself, uh, we can see that uh, one. Uh, one sign would uh, uh, significantly help us out there uh, and would be uh, because we can see that it's going to be installed there in the long term until we can do something else, take other steps uh, on that corridor to improve safety. We would probably leave it there and we'd put it on the uh, we'd put it on the north side, uh, probably trying to uh, um, we put it on the north side and we we would it's an education tool. So we'd probably face it one way for a couple of months, face it the other way for another couple of months and collect data and, and just do an education uh, at that location. Instead of putting two on either side or one on either side, we'd just put one and we could we could alter it and, and uh, um, periodically. So it, it would work. Uh, we, we could do it with one. Um, yeah. Okay, let's move along here, folks. We're getting close. Councillor Veal, Councillor Greer, and then we'll... Comment from me, we'll call the vote. Thank you, Worship. Um, and I'd just like to point out for anyone who doesn't know uh, Despard in that area very well, uh, the whole neighborhood's um, farther, what direction is that, farther west, no, let's say farther south, um, so up by Hamilton, Butler, along that way, Corfield, all of that neighborhood, which is fairly well developed and has a number of young children and children in their families, uh, if those children, and not just children, it's Despard is the access to Springwood Park, to uh, the health clinic, if we want to encourage people to be able to get out and walk to places, people in those neighborhoods would have to travel all the way down to Moss Avenue in order to access a different route to get over to the Alberni Highway, and even then there's no pedestrian crossing. So the only pedestrian crossing other than Despard is all the way down by the fire hall. So if 
it is the road that people need to use if they're going to walk anywhere and cycle. It's still, as um, Mr. Figuera pointed out, it's less than ideal because skateboards, bicycles, and, and people pushing strollers, it's pretty hard on the gravel. So I'd certainly like to support this, but I can also see the need for two because if we're going to need one in place long-term on Despard, uh, there are many other areas. I hear from people concerned about traffic on Harnish, on other areas of the city and the entrance point and also with the traffic calming measures that we're putting in place in the process, how is, um, I would imagine it would help the engineering department collect the hard data that they need to proceed with any traffic calming measures. Councillor. Thank you, Your Worship. I think if we're serious about the safety and uh, you're sure about how much it's going to help us, I, I would certainly support two signs, and I agree with Councillor Bill that there are many other places in town that those signs could be used. We could use them on 19A for sure at times. So I would suggest if we're, if we're serious about this, we should uh, purchase both of them. Thanks. Just a final comment for me before I call the vote. Uh, when we had the discussion, and it was a major discussion regarding Foster Park, everybody was concerned about traffic calming issues, and we reduced the speed limit. As, uh, as uh, Councillor Oates pointed out, uh, which was against the recommendation of, of Council. The other thing is in the report, you know, the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure and the Transportation Association of Canada both endorsed the use of speed reader boards. So I, I think that um, I think this is a good move, and I think that the overall objective of traffic calming, I, I'll support too. So on that note, I'm going to. We now move on to some very interesting topics. The seasonal commercial use in the community park, non-motorized recreational equipment rentals in the community park. Mrs. Kelleher, would you please give us the background on this issue? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So in March of 2014, Council repealed the City of Parksville community park commercial use policy, which supported seasonal commercial rentals of recreational equipment in the community park. The policy was repealed due to perceived challenges associated with the use in the park. Council has requested that staff prepare a report outlining the process, requirements and options to provide non-motorized recreational equipment rentals in the park for this 2016 season. Council has also approved a budget for a comprehensive planning process to develop a new community park master plan which will commence in the spring of 2016. The site that, is, uh, that has been used in the past is the Arbutus Point or former hovercraft site. This has been, uh, um, there have been some complaints from previous operators and if council decides that it would like to continue and lease the site for this year, we are required to provide notice prior to the lease and this typically takes place in January or February to facilitate a May to September season and the recommendations are per the agenda. Do I have a mover and a seconder for the recommendation? Moved by Councillor Beale, seconded by uh, Councillor Oates. Any comments on the two recommendations? Councillor Greer. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, my only concern is, are, are we going to drag this out long enough this year so that nothing can happen in, in the summer of 2016? Um, I'm not quite so sure when the, when the community plan is going to be done and how long it would take after that to put something into action because as last year uh, we ran out of time or we thought we ran out of time but I'm sure that we, we have to look after um, having something on the beach. So the sooner the better, I would think. Mr. Mayor, through you to Councillor Greer, the, the intent would be that the that Council would adopt the policy as it was prior to the, the park planning process, but because some of the operators have identified some concerns with the site, if Council were willing to or wanting to explore making significant changes for subsequent years, that that would wait until the community park planning process has, has commenced or at least gotten um, through the consultation process. But um, adopting the policy as it was before with no changes to address those concerns would allow it to go uh, to advertising pretty imminently 
and hopefully facilitate a start uh, May of 2016 of this year. Well, I didn't understand your question, but I'll give you a chance to ask another one. <laughs> um, by advertising now, though, there's so, so many stumbling blocks that we ran into last year. So it seems that the policy has to be changed before we can advertise so that it can, can uh, make some arrangements so something can get done this year. I, I don't see by following this plan that we're going to be up and, up and going this year on the park. Uh, let, let's let Mrs. Kelleher respond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councillor Greer. Um, I think that if Council were wanting to get it leased out for this year, um, they could just adopt it and, and the person would have full disclosure of the concerns that were raised before. When the original policy was adopted in 1994, there was quite a bit of consultation that happened with the province, um, with some nonprofit groups who are environmental in nature, um, and with several other folks um, who had interest. And um, perhaps the risk would be that if significant changes were made in advance of the community planning process, community park planning process, um, there could be concerns about some of those issues um, without people having the opportunity to, to comment. Good, thank you. Councillor Oates. Thank you, Your Worship. If I understand correctly, uh, in, in the package that I got there, if we were to, uh, to just a recommendation, to adopt uh, policy 3.34, that would allow something to happen this summer, and the, the timeline, the schedule of that happening is as per page 88 of our agenda, which I think was most of the questions that Councillor Greer was asking. All of the things there, that's, that's uh, uh, do you have a copy of it? This one, yeah, uh, this one here, yeah. So if I understand it correctly, if we were to pass this tonight, the uh, proposed uh, schedule would be as per page 88. The piece of property we're talking about is down at the hovercraft, and it's for this season only. Future discussions would take place as part of the community park master plan discussions. Thank Mrs. you. Killer. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, through you to Councillor Oates. Uh, yes, that is correct. So um, if the policy was adopted as is without significant changes, it's likely that the concerns would be similar to those that we've heard in the past, but it would allow an operator to be there in 2016 um, at the, the Arbutus Point site. Um, but given some of the perceived potential for conflict with users in the rest of the park, the recommendation would be that um, we would consult that operator and that information would feed into the park planning process and provide some very useful information, I think, um, in terms of exploring what changes maybe should be adopted in future years. Um, I, just have, I just have a quick uh, clarification, Mrs. Kelher. So by adopting the, the policy 3.34, um, have we overcome or can we overcome the fact that, first of all, the, the, uh, the service provider is responsible for the insurance? The service providers for making sure that all of the all of the equipment is is secured, and it can be secured on site. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I believe that there are some regulations in the zoning bylaw that preclude this overnight storage of the equipment, so that would still be an issue given the current regulations. Um, the policy is not changed at all from what it was prior to 2014. So there'd, there'd be, is there any, I think the question we're going to get asked, is there any room for negotiation for this year based on the policy 3.34? Well, the city is the owner of the park, so I believe that um, council could direct staff to negotiate conditions with an, with an operator. Um, there probably also would be some time between now and uh, May to make regulatory changes if council wished to do so. I do have uh, I do have a service provider that's in, interested in, in making a bid for that service for this summer, so I'm sure we'll get at least one bid. Any further questions for Mrs. Keller? Seeing none, I'm going to call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. That is carried. Once again, Mrs. Kelleher, would you please give us the background on the issue regarding the Parksville Community and Conference Center PCCC operations? And I'm. 
Before I do that, I'm going to call for a mover and a seconder for the two motions. Moved by Councilor Oates, seconded by Councilor, Councilor Greer. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Keller, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so as Council is aware, um, the PCCC is a municipally owned facility in the city of Parksville. Since 2003, it has been governed by the Parksville Community Centre Society Board of Directors. In recent years, the requested subsidies from taxpayers have been increasing at a constant rate. Um, Council passed a resolution in January, on January 7th directing staff to prepare a report with respect to costs and terms for a consultant to review the operations of the PCCC. Um, and final costs for the analysis are expected to be established after reviewing submissions for uh, qualified consulting firms or individuals. The Society and Council are jointly interested in evaluating the current operating system to determine whether the PCCC is operating as efficiently as possible and whether the current mix of events and user groups is appropriate for the Centre's defined objectives. It is anticipated that the selected consultant will be required to examine the current operating conditions, financial position of the PCCC and provide recommendations with respect to the operating agreement clauses for the future management of the facility. And the recommendations are per the agenda. Any question? First of all, I want to I want to thank publicly the um, the members of the uh, of the PCC board. We met uh, a week or two ago and had a good meeting, very positive meeting, very frank exchange of of issues and ideas. And um, this is a conclusion that uh, both uh, the Parksville Community and Conference Center board and ourselves came to. Everybody was in total agreement with it. Uh, any any other comments or questions for members of council? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. One opposed? Thank you. Um, the um, in, in concluding your reports, Mrs. Kelleher, I want to thank you very much. For, these are your first reports to council as director of admin services, and they are very thorough and uh, very thorough and informative reports. Excellent reports. Thanks very much. All right, moving on to, um, I'm going to have to hold Councillor Greer back here. I don't know if he brought his shotgun tonight, but this has been uh, one of the things that Councillor Greer and I have been many, many years on the board about the goose control program. Mrs. Comas, would you please give us the, the uh, background on the issue of goose control program in 2016? I hope you left your shotgun at home, did you? I just uh, registered a new one. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Um, as Council is aware, a, managing the geese population in Parksville and Vancouver Island as a whole has become a bit of a challenge for local governments across the island. As a result, um, a, there has been a two-pronged approach um, taken regionally with the establishment of a regional goose management group and a subgroup that is looking after the Englishman River estuary in the city of Parksville. Each municipality on the island is at a different place in the process with respect to managing geese, and fortunately Parksville is in an enviable position with, through working with the um, Guardians of the Mid-Island Estuary Society, we have a goose management strategy which Council <coughs> adopted last June. As a result of that strategy, the recommendation for going forward in 2016 is to proceed with a cull of geese in the Englishman River estuary with the permitting to be undertaken and the process undertaken by the guardians of the Mid-Island Estuaries Group. However, in order to proceed, that process requires funding and as a result, Council is being requested to approve $35,000 in 2016 and if necessary 2017 and 2018 towards the cost of the cull. And this is based on a pilot project which was undertaken by the Capital Regional District who hosted or held a cull in the summer of 2015. In addition, we are requesting the Regional District of Nanaimo to contribute funding towards this process in the amount of $12,000, which is a one-third shared cost per year for the program and any other Canada Goose initiatives that Council may choose to undertake in the future. 
The recommendations are as per the agenda. Just before I once again omitted, I need a mover and a seconder. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Patterson, seconded by Councillor Beale. Uh, just before we we, uh, we discuss this, uh, there's something I, I want to say, and it's been I've wanted to say it for a long time. I hope that this is this call is done done intelligently. You know, we've watched the geese around here. I can I can take you to where there's a couple of hundred geese any day of the week and twice on Sunday. They're all they're all over down in the estuary. So I hope that we don't we don't we don't come up with uh, somebody finding only whatever they found in the in the um, in the CRD, which was not very many. But uh, geese, that there's a molting season for geese. I hope that there's a, there's, that's when the cull will take place when they're not able to fly, and they're in significant, in significant numbers and in significant areas. And as a matter of fact, there's about 50 of them that hang out right here between our, our place. And I know I've got a lot to say about it. I'm fed up. I've been fed up now for 12 years. Let's get rid of them. Mrs. Comas, before I ask for questions. Uh, yes, Your Worship. It is certainly um, our hope that, there, that the geese will show up. And yes, it is intended for <laughs> the molting season uh, when they are not flying. Um, the, a lot of it will depend on the permitting process, but the guardians are prepared once they receive approval from Council to submit the um, permitting request imminently. and. All things being equal, we should be a bit ready to go during molting season of this year and hopefully for more than 43 geese. Councillor Greer. Thank you, Worship. I, I, uh, you and I are on the same page in this one. We've been talking about it since I was uh, first on council, 2008, and I don't know how much money we've spent. And I guess the last result I see in our report was 43 geese killed. That's a lot of money to kill 43 geese. And I'm not so sure whether these are the people to do the cull. Um, we keep giving money to this same organization, and they keep coming back and wanting more and more money, but there's very few results. The, actually, the guardians are not the ones who would undertake the cull. The guardians are the ones who will undertake the permitting process. Um, it would be an outside contractor which would be brought in to undertake the cull, and what we're looking for is a mobile abattoir. The geese have to be culled in accordance with the standards established by the Ministry of Forests Provincial Veterinarian. And she has a, a created a standard operating procedure for undertaking geese culls across the, the province. And so it would be an independent contractor that would actually undertake the cull. And that's who would be paid the funding as approved by Council. The, th the thing is, we've been doing this now, as I say, since 2008. And, and the estuary is, is worse and worse all the time. I mean, we're not improving situations, and yet it's costing us a ton of money. Um, Your Worship, through to Councillor Greer, that's absolutely true. Um, it is costing us money. Um, Council has budgeted $13,000 in the um, budget for 2016 already, which is geared for continuation of the egg addling program. Um, there is maintenance. The egg addling program, and Council has undertaken a variety of, of um, different methods over the years. There's been a dog program, and there, there's been hazing programs, and there's been all sorts of programs which have met with a variety of, of different levels of success. But with respect to the situation we are in now, in order to get to the point where we are able to get ahead of the game, so to speak, um, we need to proceed with something dramatic, which is a cull, which will hopefully, and a cull in one year likely won't bring us to where we need to be, but over the course of about three years, if we're successful in conducting culls over a course of three years, then we would get the goose population to the point where we would be able to maintain it with continued egg addling. But it's one of those problems that if we stop doing our management practices, then the problem is only going to exacerbate itself once again. So this is something that is going to be ongoing. One more. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly not in favor of spending more money on this process because I don't think it's working very well. But the other question I have is, is Qualicum not involved in this? 
I mean, the geese in Qualicum, they love Parksville as well. I mean, they fly back and forth. Um, the town of Qualicum Beach is involved in the regional group. Um, they are concerned about problems with the uh, little Qualicum estuary and their focus is in that area. Our focus is in, in this particular area. Campbell River has a focus. All the municipalities have a focus. We happen to be further along than the other municipalities in preparing to be able to proceed to something like a cull. Is Qualicum spending this kind of money? Not at this point in time, because they're not it, they are not far enough along in the process to be able to undertake such a thing as a cull. Thank you. Egg addling and hazing hasn't worked. You know, nothing has worked. I mean, it, this this was an answer that was self-evident years ago. Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so when we looking at the recommendations, it's a it says a one-third shared cost of twelve thousand. The other partners would be the regional district and. A one, just the regional district. So partners, the regional district. So is it a two thirds to the regional district and one third? No, one third to the regional district, two thirds to the city of Parksville. Okay. Um, follow up, please, Your Worship. So, in our budget, we have thirteen thousand towards the egg addling program, and based on the guardians of the, sorry, the estuary and and that. They're suggesting that we still continue with the egg addling and the cull. Okay. So my question is, how long a cull period? Is it only a day? Is it a week period? So it's one day. That's a pretty heavy It's a one-day period, and yes, it is. But the experience has been that that is the cost of conducting a cull. Now, if we have more than one contractor bids on the on the program, then we may be in a position of being able to get a better price point, and if we will, we certainly won't spend all of the money. But at this point in time, that's our best guess okay, as to so just what it's going to follow cost. up. So we're going to ask for a proposal, like, mm -hmm. and that. But right now, we're only looking at the Englishman River estuary. So if we did, by chance, have a proposal that comes in, could we look at the park? or other areas of the city as well. That's my question. I don't believe that you would want to do a call in the community <laughs> park. Oh, come on. <laughs> After I... <laughs> um, you know, as the provincial veterinarian has developed a process um, for undertaking a cull, which is humane, but that doesn't mean that it's pretty. I realize that, but as someone that hunts and and that too, $725 a bird is pretty freaking expensive. Yes, it is. Uh, just a, just a moment, Mr. Councilor Beale. You know, the, the other th obvious thing here is the overpopulation is significant. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of birds, 300 and some odd birds overpopulated. And what I noticed about the report that I didn't like is there's no mention of disease. I mean, the feces that we see all over the place, if you're stepping on it and your bare feet in the park, or if you're stepping on it uh, with your, even with your shoes on and getting into your car, uh, and when I see them down in the, on the beach swimming in the water, uh, you know, at 20 or 30 geese at a time. So that's something that at some point in time I'd like staff to review with the wildlife people. There's no mention of disease, and, you know, from, from my records, I know that there's been, there's been contamination done at beaches. Luckily, we have the tides, but a lot of beaches don't. And there's contamination, you know, there's water contamination, and you have to close your beach. So I'd, li I'd like to see more emphasis on what kind of disease to make this thing more aggressive. Councillor uh, Councillor Beal. Thank you, Worship. Um, a follow-up to a uh, few comments by Councillor Greer, just the, the mention and question about Qualicum. From my recollections of reading the detailed and extensive report that was presented to us uh, last year by the Guardians of the Estuary, uh, you know, our situation is not the same as the situation in, let's say, Qualicum Beach and other areas uh, where the geese down in the estuary then often fly to private lands outside of the town in that case where farmers and others can in fact um, 
do something with the geese. And unfortunately, or fortunately for the geese at present, it seems that our estuary geese tend to stay within city limits, which means that nobody's hunting them or doing anything like that. So, so we do have a, a situation that's unique to us. So I think it's we could run into difficulty if we try to compare communities, uh, if we're comparing apples to oranges. Also, I would hope, I don't know if um, the community park geese are nesting in the park. Uh, hopefully they're actually nesting in the estuary. And again, going back to the report that was very extensive and detailed, and then I followed up uh, with uh, talking with some of the people who were involved with that report. And one of the reasons, it, it, it just seemed that with their um, study, they found many more nesting areas in the estuary than they had previously thought. So although it looked like the number was increasing, what it was, it, they really felt that they were doing a better job at locating them. So hopefully, um, and they don't tend to move their nests, so hopefully that will also lead to better success with egg addling and for what it's worth, I understand that one can be a volunteer egg addler. So for any of you out there who might want to consider such a um, something to add to their CVs, uh, that might be something to consider and to help the cause. Good point. Okay, seeing no further comments, and we're going to do all five at the same time. I can do that, Mrs. Gomez. I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. That is carried. Okay. We have next, we have uh, three readings. The five-year provisional financial plan bylaw 2016-2020, number 1522. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Oates, seconded by Councillor Beal. Uh, any, any, any comments, questions? All those in favor? I'm sorry. Uh, Your Worship, there is a memorandum on table with respect to the table of the, for the um, water utility fund and the general fund. That yes, the, we, the, I, we, I think okay. we all read it, yeah. All right. That's We're all aware fine. of that. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. That is carried. Okay, members of council, we're at that stage, uh, and then it's called new business. Do, does any member of council have any new business for this evening? Councillor Beal. Thank you, Worship. Uh, oh, I forgot my toque. Um, I'll just share that I did attend the library board meeting recently, and I thought there were a couple of very interesting facts that people might like to know. For all of you who use your library card, or for your children who might use the library card, uh, any guesses as to how much that card is worth? Lots. That's a good answer. Thank you. Uh, it has actually been calculated this past year to be worth $1,028. Now that is based on, uh, calculated by dividing the market value of resources borrowed from your library by the number of registered borrowers. Now, we do have a rather unique library because it's the Vancouver Island Regional Library, so it, it spans a huge geographical area, but that also means that we have have an amazing collection that is quite mobile and I understand that upward of 95,000 items are circulated uh, every month uh, in our library system. So it's a very, very vibrant um, organization if I could say. And uh, yes, once again, that library card can save you about $1,000 worth of purchasing materials if you were to go that other route, uh, including it. And I understand as well for people out there who've been using, there's a new system, it's the integrated library system. And uh, I, I heard a few concerns early on. I haven't heard anything recently. And a number of people I know who are using it are getting the hang of it. So it has an increase. It's easier to download e-books and e-items. So that could be cool. And also expanded video. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Beale. That was very informative. Any other members of council have anything under new business? The only thing that I wanted to tell council about is last week at the RDN board, we had a, we have a, 
a regular meeting with the Qualicum Beach, or Qualicum First Nations, I take that back, uh, and we have now developed a protocol with, from the, with the RDN board and the Qualicum Beach, or Qualicum First Nations. So um, once that protocol is approved, I'll be bringing that to council to show it to you, to discuss it with you, and it ser could serve very well serve as a template. It's a very interesting document. It could very well serve as a template uh, for our relationships with the Qualicum First Nations and the News First Nations. So we'll have that to look forward to in, in a few weeks' time. I meant to bring the toque tonight, I'm sorry I left it at home, but February 20th, there will be another, the second annual walk, uh, the coldest night of the year, which is a walk to raise awareness and funds to uh, help with the um, services for the homeless in the area. So, Councillor Greer, are you on again this year? I haven't, I haven't, I'm just forming my team. It'll be a team, but no, I'm I ready to challenge I you. I haven't got a team this year. I've been to the well too, uh, too often. Oh, And okay. it's coming up dry now. Well, nobody then. Wa nobody wants to see me come in the door. Then, Councillor Greer, I'll be happy to take your money and you could help <laughs> support me in my efforts I, with I my team. Do, I will do that. Thank you. Councillor Beale's got my money, by the way, so I'm going to put a lot. So seeing nothing else under new business, members of council, thank you very much. Now I need a mover and a seconder pursuant to section 91E of the community charter. Council proceed to a closed meeting to consider an item relating to land. I have a mover, Councillor Greer, seconded by Councillor uh, Beal. All those in favor, we are now going to take five minutes, so we're going to go into cam in camera.